Um, I'm delighted that uh, we're doing this. I suggested this uh, panel to my colleagues at the Climate Emergency Forum, including uh, Regina and Charles and Heidi, because I thought that the prior production gap reports by the Stockholm Environment Institute and the United Nations Environment Program were incredibly important, and I anticipated that this would be important again here at this COP. today's program. My name is Regina Valdez and I'm your host. I'm here with the Climate Emergency Forum and today we'll be discussing the 2023 Production Gap Report. And I am here with two very special guests. First is Anisha Nazareth. Anisha is an associate scientist with Equitable Transitions Program. That is the Equitable Transitions Program. Uh, she has been with the SEI US since 2020, and most of her work focuses on the interactions between climate crises and global and local inequities. And to my left is Dan Galpern, and Dan is a founder, executive director, and general counsel to the Climate Protection and Restoration Initiative which is a nonprofit organization. He has served as legal and policy advisor to climate scientist Dr. James Hansen since 2011. Prior to the law, Dan worked for 20 years as a public interest analyst and advocate for human rights and global security. So I am going to leave it at that because I'm very interested to hear about this report, as I'm sure you are as well. Thank you so much, Anisha. Thank you. Yeah, so the production gap report, um, and this, this year's report is the fourth in the series, was launched in 2019 to complement UNEP's emission gap report series and to introduce fossil fuel production gap as a new sort of concept and metric uh, by which to measure progress towards meeting our climate goals. So the global energy landscape is shaped by both fossil fuel demand and supply. Our report focuses on supply, given its notable lack of attention in national and international climate policy making up until recent years. So the PGR tracks the discrepancy between the global levels of fossil fuel production planned and projected by governments and those consistent with the Paris Agreement's temperature goals. So in this report, Compared to our 2020 report, which was the last one, we have a comprehensive update of the global production gap analysis, um, at, which reflect government's plans and projections as of August this year, and new pathways informed by the IPCC's sixth assessment report mitigation scenarios database. We also explore the equity implications of government plans for the first time. We do a deeper dive on global reduction pathways for coal, oil, and gas. We consider the uncertainties around carbon capture and storage and carbon dioxide removal, taking into account long-term global reduction targets for coal, oil, and gas. You also find the expanded profiles of 20 key producer countries with an overview of their climate ambitions, plans, policies, and strategies that continue to support fossil fuel production or transition away from it in a managed and equitable way. So to quantify the production gap, we first identify the global pathways of fossil fuel production that would be consistent with limiting global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. That's shown on the graph by the purple and green lines and their respective interquartile ranges. These pathways represent the total coal, oil, and gas supply intended for all energy and non-energy uses and are informed by selected mitigation scenarios from the IPCC sixth assessment report. So in a nutshell, these model-generated scenarios chart out cost-optimized pathways for limiting warming to a given temperature threshold, relying on different combinations and extents of major mitigation strategies to transform our energy and land use systems to achieve net zero CO2 emissions. Next, we estimate the so-called government plans and projections pathway which is shown by the red line. This represents our estimate of the global levels of fossil fuel production 
implied by government's plans and projections, which are based on a review of recent and publicly available national energy outlooks of 19 major fossil fuel producing countries as of August 2023. These 19 countries account for 80% of global fossil fuel production. Their aggregate projections are then scaled up to a global pathway based on these countries' estimated shares of future global production as modeled by the IEA under a scenario consistent with fulfilling their stated climate policies. The production gap is the discrepancy between the red line and the green or purple line. So it's the discrepancy between the global levels of fossil fuel production under government plans and projections and those under the 1.5 or 2 degree consistent pathway in any given year. In this year's report, we also show the global production pathways implied by countries' stated climate policies, and that's the solid gold line, and by countries' announced climate pledges as of September 2022, that's the dashed gold line, as modeled by the International Energy Agency. And finally, I want to note that fossil fuel production can be represented in several units. Quantifying the production pathways in energy-based units allows for a direct comparison to the model outputs of the IPCC-assessed scenarios, but we can also aggregate across coal, oil, and gas to represent production in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas emissions expected to be released from extraction and combustion activities, which you see plotted in this figure. And that allows for comparability with other climate assessments like the UNEP emissions gap. So in this year's analysis, we find that in aggregate, governments are planning to produce around 110% more fossil fuels than would be consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and 69% more than would be consistent with limiting warming to 2 degrees Celsius. That's in 2030. And the production gap with respect to both temperature limits grows wider out to 2050. It's also worth noting that the size of the overall produ production gap in 2030 has remained largely unchanged compared, with, compared to our prior assessments. This is despite the fact that there are encouraging signs of an emerging clean energy transition. However, the persistence of the production gap puts a well-managed and equitable energy transition at risk and also conflicts with government's climate commitments. The production gap can also be shown in terms of its component fuels. So plotted here in both energy and physical-based units, you can see um, the figure showing the global production of coal, oil, and gas. And you see that in order to meet the 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius pathways, they need to decline substantially and rapidly between now and 2050. However, as shown by the red pathway, government's plans and projections would collectively lead to an increase in global coal production until 2030 and an increase in global oil and gas production until at least 2050. By 2030, government's production plans and projections would lead to around 460% more coal, 29% more oil, and 82% more gas than would be consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Given that government's production plans and targets help to influence, legitimize, and justify continuous fossil fuel dependence, there's a real risk that such plans undermine the energy transition by locking in long-lived fossil fuel infrastructure. And many of these investments in infrastructures could become stranded assets as the world decarbonizes and fossil fuel production targets fail to reflect falling demands and changing socio-political realities. The size and nature of global production also raises the question of how it can be closed in a managed and equitable way. So it's beyond the scope of this year's report to provide differentiated 1.5 degree Celsius pathways for different countries, as was explored in the 2020 PGR. But an equitable transition should recognize that country circumstances differ widely, depending on their financial and institutional capacities, as well as their level of socioeconomic dependence on fossil fuel production. So taking income level for the World Bank classification as a broad proxy for transition capacity, we find that the levels of planned coal, oil, and gas production of 10 high-income countries alone would exceed global levels under the 1.5 degrees Celsius consistent pathways by 2040, as you see from the figures. Repeating this exercise, but grouping countries by their levels of relative economic dependence on fossil fuel productions, we find that the plans and projections of 12 countries with relatively low dependence would still ex exceed the global 1.5 degrees Celsius pathways by 2040. So how then can we close the production gap? 
Well, first, it's very important that governments should be more transparent in their plans and projections and support for fossil fuel production and how they align with their national and international climate goals. They need to implement strategies to ensure a well-managed and rapid global decline in global production and consumption in coordination with scaling up clean energy systems. Adopt near and long-term reduction targets in fossil fuel production and use that to complement other climate mitigation targets and to reduce the risk of lock-in or stranded assets. At minimum, we need to aim for a near total phase out of coal production and use by 2040, and the combined reduction in oil and gas production and use by three quarters by 2050 from 2020 levels. This is in light of the risks associated with too much dependence on carbon dioxide removal or CCS. We also need to recognize countries' differentiated responsibilities and capabilities, and governments with greater transition capacity should aim for more ambitious reductions and help finance the transition efforts in countries with limited capacity. I'm going to hand it over to Dan now, uh, but thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for breaking that all down for us, Anisha. That was really informative. I, one question that just comes to my mind, I'm not asking you, it's, uh, it's rhetorical, is who is going, we have this gap, and maybe, maybe Dan can address this, but like who is going to make countries, what is going to make countries close the gap? Because as of now, I kind of don't see any incentive or any outside power that can make that happen. But I'm very interested to hear what you have to add, uh, Dan. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Regina and Anisha. Um, I'm delighted that uh, we're doing this. I suggested this uh, panel to my colleagues at the Climate Emergency Forum, including uh, Regina and Charles and Heidi, because I think I thought that the prior production gap reports by the Stockholm Environment, uh, Environment Institute and the United Nations Environment Program were incredibly important, and I anticipated that this would be important again here at this COP. To directly answer your question, at issue in this COP, among other things, is whether the nations will at long last commit to a phase-out of fossil fuels. That is within uh, uh, reach if uh, people wish, um, if the nations at this, at this conference uh, would do that. Now, um, Anisha did not show, but the uh, pattern of production of coal, oil, and gas where it is anticipated that there will be a phase-out worldwide of uh, a phase-down of coal utilization, but yet still a continued increase in the production of oil and coal, is also mirrored in the, in the United States in light of commitments by oil, and gas, and coal companies uh, over the next 30 years. And this is shameful, of course. And, and this occurs even with the implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. And in fact, what you see, interestingly, in the United States is a reduction, an anticipated substantial reduction in the demand for fossil fuels uh, over the next uh, two decades and a half, and yet a continued increase in production of at least oil and natural gas. So what's happening is the United States, of course, has become the world leading exporter of uh, natural gas and one of the uh, major producers also of, of oil. And so even as we are projected to reduce our own utilization, our commitment to keeping the rest of the world hooked on oil and gas continues. So let me take uh, a moment then to simply name uh, some of the uh, oil and gas projects that have been approved even just by the Biden administration. And here I'm only going to mention those whose annual emissions uh, will exceed 50 million tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, the Dakota Access uh, Pipeline uh, in uh, North Dakota to Illinois 101 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent on an annual basis. Enbridge Line 3 from Alberta to Wisconsin, 175 annually. Uh, Enbridge Line 5 from Wisconsin to Ontario, 71 million metric tons of CO2. 
annually with respect to fracked gas pipelines, the Mountain Valley Pipeline in West Virginia and Vir Virginia, uh, 89.5 estimated million metric tons annually. Driftwood Line 200 and 300 in Louisiana, 201 million metric tons CO2 equivalent annually. The Gulf Run Pipeline in Louisiana, Texas, 75 million metric tons. In terms of a crude oil export terminal, this seaport oil terminal in, in, uh, in Texas anticipated to yield uh, an annual emissions of 331 million metric tons. Uh, Rio Grande uh, in Brownsville, Texas, 163. The Alaska LNG pipeline from the North Slope to Cook Inlet, Alaska, 121 million metric tons of CO2. And the uh, Port Arthur trains, uh, three and four expansion in Port Arthur, Texas, 82 million metric tons. And Commonwealth LNG in uh, Cameron Parish in Louisiana, 51 uh, million metric tons. And I just listed those that are, again, over 50 million metric tons on an annual basis. Uh, there is a number of other major fossil fuel project approvals under the credit of the Biden administration. The lifetime, and, and by the way, this analysis is from the Center on Biological Diversity, a report recently published, Out Polluting Progress. The lifetime climate pollution, they say, from these drilling projects totals 3.2 billion metric tons, and that is equivalent to the annual emissions from 861 coal-fired power plants. And astonishingly, the emissions that are anticipated uh, from uh, these projects are likely to double, be twice as much as the emissions reductions that were projected by the Biden administration that would derive from the Inflation Reduction Act. And as they say, uh, and I think this is an understatement, Thus, the Biden administration's fossil fuel approvals threatened to erase, I would use the term eviscerate, the emissions progress projected under the IRA and other climate policy. So we have a real problem uh, worldwide and in the United States. And I, I focus on the United States not only because I am from there, but because the United States bears larger responsibility for our current climate predicament why is that? Well, predominantly because of the long-lived nature of CO2. Once uh, in the atmosphere, at least a, a quarter of it remains essentially forever unless we accelerate its removal. So, you know, you think, well, what, what can be done? Or if only there were a law uh, that could be utilized for this purpose, uh, a law that, for example, would allow our key environmental agency to uh, look at the problem of oil, gas, and coal production and utilization in the United States and exportation and determine that uh, these substances present an unreasonable risk of injury to health or the environment, right? Well, in fact, there, it, it, as it turns out, there is such a law. And on Friday, the Environmental Protection Agency utilized that statute to ban the production and utilization of a very harmful chem uh, chemical called PFAS, uh, also known as forever chem chemicals, under the authority of the statute that I was talking about, the Toxic Substance Control Act, because doing so would help protect the public from exposure to, danger to these dangerous chemicals. So there is a law. It's fit for the purpose. It's being utilized right now. And uh, for those of you, including the supporters of CPR Initiative that will be uh, watching this when we put it up on our website, um, who are interested in the potential utilization of that statute to turn things around in the United States, stay tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Dan. And I really loved your analogy about keeping other countries hooked on fossil fuels. And I am reminded of the craven business practices of the cigarette industry. Once uh, people in the West, and especially America, started cutting down on smoking and their product became less profitable, they started promoting the same exact tactics 
that they did in the 50s in the United States, which was, of course, telling women in various parts of Africa that uh, smoking was a sign of liberation. It was the woman's movement. You've come a long way, baby. All of this type of thing. So, you know, they, they looked for new avenues to peddle their dare I say, death product. Um, and one of the things I'm interested in, Dan, when you mention the Toxic Substances Control Act, who defines what is toxic? I mean, obviously PFAS, the forever chemicals are toxic, but also, as you state, carbon and, of course, methane, literally, at least in human time scale, also stays in the environment forever. And we know that many millions of people die every year because of the burning and extraction of fossil fuel. So what is the determining factor of what applies as a toxic substance? Well, the determining factor ultimately is the courts in the event that there's a contention, for example, by a citizen's group that a certain chemical needs to be banned. Of course, the agency can uh, take the action uh, on its own initiative. But the definition is very clear, and I stated it before. The chemical substance is determined to present an unreasonable risk of injury to health or the environment. Then the administrator, that is the head of the EPA, shall, so must, not may, shall take action, including to restrict to the point of prohibition the production or uh, importation or processing uh, or use or export or disposal of the uh, chemical substance or material at, at issue. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a broad, capacious definition, and it's one of the many reasons why the statute's uh, fit for the purpose. Let me just say one thing about the analogy with respect to, to tobacco, if I can. We're dealing here with, uh, in fossil fuels, uh, oil, gas, and coal, uh, with the substance which, if, ut if used as intended, will injure uh, persons and the environment in the United States whether the, that material, those products, are burned in the United States or burned anywhere else in the world. Of course, the uh, local impacts may be uh, greater, but here we're talking about a well-mixed greenhouse gases, uh, CO2, uh, methane, the other Kyoto 6 greenhouse gases. And so if we're going to uh, preserve or save any nation, we really need to act worldwide and preserve the climate system for all current and future generations. Thank you, Dan. I had a, a quick follow-up uh, question for Anisha, if I may, um, and this kind of piggybacks on, on what I just uh, spoke to with Dan, and that's the other side of the coin, which is, as we know, the fossil fuel uh, energy derived from fossil fuel is right now, uh, very, very cheap. So when, the, when this product is being exported to uh, lesser developed countries um, who don't have the scale up for um, renewable energy, how can we negate giving them this product that can help them to advance their economies? In other words, what is the argument against shipping fossil fuels to these lesser developed nations when they need fossil fuel to develop, ostensibly? So the fossil fuels are not being shipped as aid. They're being sold to less developed nations. And one of the arguments that countries sometimes use is that their, their fossil fuels are cleaner or more efficient in production, and that they're lower production emissions, for example, and therefore they are better for the environment than some of the, than coal or fossil fuels that are extracted in less clean and efficient way. But that kind of ignores the fact that the countries, the, these countries are also the best positioned to make the transition, and any reduction really is good for the climate. And so countries that are capable of transitioning should really be taking the lead. There's no real justification for selling fossil fuels to, for continuing to increase production and selling it to developing countries on the basis of development because we've seen that renewable energies now, there are so many renewable energies that are cost effective and are scalable and you, you can make a much better argument for providing adequate quantities of climate finance to these countries to scale up their renewable energy production. So when there are so many other options and we are already seeing the catastrophic impacts of climate change, there's really no justification for selling fossil fuels on the basis of development. But I, I would add to this that our overproduction of fossil fuels and flooding the market is depressing the price 
driving demand uh, for um, our product around the world. And so until the price of fossil fuels reflects the damage that results, that demand is going to be high. So in, in two ways then, we are we're depressing the price around the world by flooding the market, uh, and we continue to fail to impose any type of carbon price in the United States. It's an untenable situation. Uh, we're even behind Europe in this regard. A number of European countries have now imposed carbon taxes on top of the European trading system. And so uh, we, have a lot to, we have a lot of work to do to move our nation from laggard to leader. Thank you so much. I really, really like that. Moving the states from laggard to leader. Thank you. Um, I really want to thank everyone for being here today. I especially want to thank Anisha and Dan. Thank you both so very much. And the Climate Emergency Forum would also like to thank uh, Sustainable Population Australia, as well as the International Society for Ecological Economics. So thank you all so very much.